A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for foreign fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute comes one becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh, but anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you are bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God with your body. The word of the Lord. Lord be with you. May the Lord be on our minds, on our lips, and on our hearts as we hear his holy gospel. The holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. We'll be reading John's gospel starting chapter 1, verse 43. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him, about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord.
I'd like to invite the children to come for prayer and a blessing. Please extend your hands. Lord, thank you so much for these blessings that you have given us. And we pray that as they go to their lesson, that their ears would be open to hear what you would have them hear. And that their teachers... Their lips would only speak what you would have them speak. And it's so appropriate after this last song to send these children away and bless them before they go, Lord. And we ask, as we always do for these children, that when they are old, that their testimony would be that there's never been a day in all my life that I didn't know and love Jesus with all my heart. And we ask that you would bless them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. So that's good. Now I've got that tune in my head for the rest of the day, and that's, which is better than the tune I had before, which for random reasons was na 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 before we started. Yeah. I do have a few announcements. Um, there's going to be a clipboard going around again for the lector uh, training. That's the readers up here. That's going to be next week. Waffle House is going to uh, cater that lunch. And speaking of which, I know a lot of you are interested to know how the um, men's breakfast yesterday went. I'll ask the men, just by a show of, or clap, how did you feel like it went yesterday? <laughs> Excellent. So I know that I uh, have been encouraging you all for the past couple of weeks to tip them, and to tip them well. <laughs> And we did, we did do that. So my goal, my personal internal goal was that we would tip 250 and we doubled that. Yeah. So, and the lady, for, for those of you that were there yesterday, the lady that assisted, that was serving you, um, 
if you have seen the article that went out in the picture of the, the beautiful little girl sitting in Santa's lap, um, if you haven't seen that, you can go back and look at in your emails it was sent. But we actually hosted for them over before Christmas, their, the Waffle House children, which about 100 to 150 of them had signed up to do it, to come and sit with Santa. We just offered the space because it was better space than what they had. There was, or I asked them to take a bunch of pictures because I wanted to do a, a press release. So um, the picture that was chosen actually was the granddaughter of the lady that served us yesterday. So yeah, it was awesome. So I went over there afterwards because I had a newspaper article with her picture in it. And so I gave it to her where she was working after the thing. And um, I, by that time I knew how much they had been tipped. And so I had talked to my friend, Brian Williams, who was the, the one from the Waffle House side that set it up. And I said, $500, really? I said, they're going to be fighting to come back, aren't they? And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. Lisa already won that fight. <laughs> Lisa went back and announced that that was her gig from now on. So. Um, I would like to uh, make an announcement for the Quins. Um, is Josiah here? Come on up here, Mo. He's getting his head shaved. Yeah! <laughs> I'm sorry, but that was hilarious. <laughs> but I do say so myself. Okay, so I would like uh, everybody um, to listen up to, to hear what Josiah has accomplished. Josiah graduated at cum laude with a baccalaureate of science in audio engineering and production from Middle Tennessee State University, and he did it all in two and a half years. So <laughs> give him a hand. Everyone, please stand and welcome for me um, our patriarch, our Archbishop, Craig Bates. Wow, good, good to be here. And uh, good to see Bishop in the back. And, uh, I had one disappointment this weekend. Is, uh, I saw the men's breakfast the announcement that came out. And uh, I have never been to a Waffle House. I'm a Yankee. We don't have Waffle House. We have White Castle, which is, which is food that also helps as a diuretic. <laughs> um, so anyways, I, I, I got the thing, and there's this picture of Waffle House, the men's breakfast. I said, I'm finally going to eat at Waffle's House. And it's right down the street from where my hotel was. And so I drove there until I realized it was here at the church. <laughs> <laughs> but one of these days, I just have, I have to go to a Waffle House and, uh, and uh, enjoy that cuisine. It, it's good to be with you. And... Um, I'm going to give you the word, and, um, and I could probably then go sit down, but I'm not going to because I'm a preacher. And um, we can't help ourselves. You know, the last thing you ever want to do is turn to a preacher and say, you got anything to say? <laughs> it's based on the gospel. And um, the word's really simple. And it's really particularly for you, Jason, to remember. It's a word that... I've struggled with for four, over four decades in my own prayer life, my own reading of scripture, and of things that, that I've done. And the word is this. You are called to someone, not to something. Good. Repeat that. You are called, not you, all of you, but you know, as 
Jason steps in to protect the thing. You call to someone, not to something. Now, when you find the someone, he'll tell you the something that you're to walk on. And it'll be a surprise sometimes. You see? Now, I, I think that's really important because I read a Bishop Epsilon article. I read your articles all the time. They, they come to me in five different forms. <laughs> <laughs> And, I, and I'm going to say something, but it's really not in contradiction of what you wrote the last one about knowing, if you know what somebody does, you can somewhat see who they are. And I just want to go at that as another direction, if you will, and not contradictory. From the time I was, could hear, I was asked by everybody, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, parents, what are you going to do when you grow up? You know? Now we ask, what gender are you going to be? <laughs> you know? And that's scary because when I was growing up, all every kid male it, that I knew, this is a long time, wanted to be a fireman or a policeman or a cowboy. And if they did that, we'd have a lot of policemen and firemen and cowboys. So now we're asking them, what gender are they? Scary, isn't it? Little girls, I guess it was princesses. You know, all my, girl, my girls wanted to be princesses when they, they grew up. And all they had to do was find a king and a prince, I guess. But we know that that, that changed. And, and there's something in our our culture that's obsessed with what do you do? It's very practical. You're going to college. What are you going to college for? What are you going to do when you get out of college? Parents ask that a lot because they've just spent $120,000. <laughs> <laughs> know, what are you going to do? And it's, and it's because in a way, we define ourselves in the Western culture by what we do. We're a practical people. That's not true around the world, by the way. It's a very Western concept, and it's very ingrained in education that we teach to do. Well, it's, it's, and, and we go through, when I was in high school, we had uh, three tracks, they're tracking, which is illegal now, I think, in some states. But it was, you were college tracked, you were business tracked, or you were shop tracked. And they would decide that by your IQ, by what you're interested in, and, and determine that. And that's how you graduated from high school. And, and it was, um, I tell you, I wanted to say it was equal, but it wasn't. College kids were the cream of the crop. You know, business, you were okay, but you were a trade person. It's almost a segregation of, of the group, but it was by what you do. And men are particularly prone to that. When we meet somebody, we say, hi, what's your name? I'm Craig. No, what do you do? Okay. And so, so if you're, you're a doctor, cool. But then you got down, it's ranked by what do you do? And so I made a point, unlike Bishop, I made a point of never asking anybody what to do. Uh, just don't ask. They can tell me because there's a tendency to evaluate by that. I mean, really seriously. We took all my kids to Disney World. I remember the first trip. It, it, somebody gave it to us. Their own pastor. They gave us three days in Disney. This is back years and years ago. And, and lodging. We, we, they had a, a mission home. Their missionaries would come. We stayed there and then we'd go into Disney. It was July. <laughs> okay, with two, three kids. And it was hot. I mean, hot. And we entered the Magic Kingdom, I remember the first day, all excited, and the lines. I mean, you know, if you've been there, I can see some of you chuckling. Your lines, 
waiting and waiting for an hour and a half for a five minute ride. <laughs> you know? And once you got done doing that, you'd do it again. But if you remember, if you went to Disney, I don't know if they still do it, because I refuse to stand in lines. I send the grandchildren and I go find a cold drink. <laughs> and uh, Kat said, you're going to miss the smiles on their faces. No, I won't. <laughs> my daughter, Sarah, who, uh, my, my wife Kathy's here someplace. I think she was six. And uh, six years old, I think. And uh, the youngest. And we would, we would get, in, get in line and you wait, you wait, you wait. And you finally come to the point where there's a person standing there and they ask you a question. How many in your party? And you go four, three, and then they get you a seat on the ride. After the second ride, my daughter turns to me and says, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be the person who asks everybody, how many in your party? <laughs> I said, could you set your sights like just a little higher? <laughs> but it was, and uh, well, what to do? What am I, what, what do I do is going to define something. Now, here's what, why I want to bring this to attention for Christians. So many Christians are running around asking that question of the Lord. And he's asking you, who? Who? What is your relationship with me? And from that answer to that question, things will become clear. Now some things will become clear before you ask. Well, I know for certain that I was never called to be a ballet dancer. <laughs> or a marathon runner, by the way. There were just things that were eliminated. Somebody said to me, what is the book that you read growing up that made you cry the most? Algebra. <laughs> So there was physicists and nuclear scientists were war ruled out, you know? Now probably, why I got where I am is that um, I have an opinion about everything and always did. And uh, so I ended up being a preacher. <laughs> but that, that to do is not the question, especially for discipleship. You see, when we, when we come, it's just key to get hold of. You all know the verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. It doesn't say there is a way, the truth, and the life. It says, I am. You follow me? I am the way, the truth, and the life. You follow me? See, so the question is always to put to people in discipleship is, who do you say that I am? Hmm? That's the question. Now, it's got, now, again, where I struggle with that is I automatically want to go from that question to what am I going to do? Now, that Paul did that. Now, Paul, when he met Jesus, he had two questions. Who are you, Lord? What do you want me to do? And Jesus never answered the question. What he told him was, go to this Ananias and get your eyes back. <laughs> right? That was what, all he had to do. He didn't say, oh, go to the Gentiles or go to this or that. But go to this guy and you'll be able to see again. And what are you supposed to see? See, here's a pattern in Scripture. You, follow, you can go home and study this. It's all Bible stuff. Pattern, particularly in John and in Revelation. It's here, and 
turn around and see. What do you see? It's, it's all over scripture. What do you see? The great story of scripture, the blind, blind uh, guy, you know, who it says he did, couldn't see from birth. Remember that story? And if you don't, go read it. And here's this guy, and, and the disciples say, well, it's, it's because of his sin or his parents' sin, or oh, right into theology. God, God, poor Jesus, you know. And now he goes to the blind man, and the Greek word there, it's really interesting. The Greek implies not that the man was blind, but he didn't have any eyeballs. That's how blind he was. Huh? And what does Jesus do? He makes mud. Sound familiar from Genesis? <laughs> he creates, which says a lot about who Jesus is, right? Well, in that act, he said, hey, I'm God. I can make eyeballs. You think making people see is cool. Watch this. <laughs> and he makes eyeballs. And then it says the man can see. See what? See him. That's the question John asked. Says, but these things are all written so that you may believe and see. See, it's implied that all of us have a spiritual vision problem. We all need, right from the start, new eyeballs. That's the story of that blind man. Each of us. And some of us might have eyeballs, but we can't see. <coughs> Remember the Pharisees? You have eyes, but you can't see. You can't see who's standing. I've always wondered, like, why is that? Why couldn't the Pharisees, who are staring into the face of God, don't see what's going on because they're spiritually blind and deaf too. That's why John says again, I love John, says in order to see the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. Some creative thing has to happen in you, in us, to see. And so the call is to him, to a person, to follow Jesus. <laughs> Jesus says over and over again, he says that in the gospel today, come follow me. That's discipleship, by the way. Discipleship is not learning the 66 books of the Bible. That'll come along. See, you can search the scriptures Morning to night for the rest of your life and miss the one about whom the scriptures supply. It's right, you can miss it. Unless there's that, you're called to him. And again, I'm telling you, I've struggled with that all my life. Because I'm a doer. Okay? I like to do. If I'm not doing something, I think something's not happening. And one of the things that scares me the most in my life is I can do things for God, and they're really good, except that God isn't in it. <laughs> There's nothing, nowhere to be found. And then I have a really hard time giving it up. You know, hey, Jesus, I put a lot of work into this, and I'm impressed. <laughs> and so here we have this story of Nathaniel, which is a perfect, now I'll get to the gospel, although I actually said the gospel. Little stuff just to remind you, because I know you, I mean, this is a biblically literate congregation, so I don't want to do a Bible study. But just to point out some things in the story, you got Nathaniel, and, um, He's under, and a fig tree. Now, what we know from fig, about fig trees in the Bible 
is that they are a sign of the nation of Israel. You know, whether they bear fruit or don't bear fruit, you know, all the illustrations to, uh, to a fig tree. And it suggests, what John is suggesting here with one thing he's suggesting, and a whole lot of stuff, Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree, is that Nathaniel is a seeker after the Messiah of Israel. He wants to see Israel come. Now it's also a fig tree, it's known as a place of prayer. The men of Israel, oftentimes, if they were particularly like middle class, a little bit of money, they would plant a fig tree in their backyard. And they would go sit under the fig tree and pray. So here's Nathaniel, before Jesus even shows up, is a seeker after the Messiah. And he's in prayer. And Philip knows that. Philip knew Nathaniel. Okay. And he comes and says, we found, I found what? The Messiah. I found the one, Nathaniel, you're seeking. The one, the person. And he, a great theologian, graduating from St. Michael's Seminary, says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> like, here's your answer, Nathaniel. Here it is. And then Jesus, aren't you glad if Jesus is tolerant? <laughs> Lord have mercy, things I've said to him and done. But he comes and says, Nathaniel, I see your heart. I see inside of you. I know who you are. Jesus knows who you are. You know, and thank God, stupidity does not disqualify you from ministry. Or bad theology, by the way. I have a great story. There's a <laughs> Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael Ramsey. If you're a theologian, read Michael Ramsey. If you're not, don't do it. But he was brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant. And in the Anglo Catholic wing of the Episcopal Church. And he came to my seminary. Now, if the Archbishop of Canterbury shows up at your seminary, that's a big deal. You know? They pulled out all the toots and whistles and parade and hats and plumes and everything else that an Episcopalian can do well. And he gave a lecture. Now, in, so all the seminarians, this is a command performance, are in there. And there's one seminarian who's a friend of mine who had a photographic memory. You know, he just, I used to hate him because he didn't have to take notes. He, did, he just, and he would read a book and remember the footnotes. <laughs> no, I mean, it's that kind of just, and, and he's in, in the congregation on there, and Michael Ramsey gives this amazing talk in, in the King's, or the Queen's English, you know, like with a mar full of marbles, but, and so it sounded really intelligent. And, um, And my friend, he, Lord Ramsey says, are there any questions? And sure enough, my friend stands up. And he says, your eminence, in your book, da, 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 on page 200 and da, 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 in the third paragraph, you said exactly the opposite of what you said tonight. Michael goes, hmm, changed my mind. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've changed my mind. If I look back on my journey, I, was not, I am not what I am today. I started my adult journey in places like Woodstock and the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement. And then I became a psychologist. 
But I'm not working, the only thing that's consistent is I continue to work with drug addicts and still do, and prisoners. And here I am, I became a priest in the Episcopal Church, which I'm no longer part of, and joined the CEC. And God on God became a bishop. And now I'm traveling around the world. Now nowhere in the what do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? Nothing to do. And I've changed my mind on many things theologically, because I've grown. So here's Nathaniel getting challenged by God in this thinking about the Messiah, that who he is. And then he says to him, so Nathaniel says, he gets it. He says, you are the son of God. Not the son of man, by the way. You're the son of God. He's recognizing for a brief moment that Jesus is God in the flesh, standing there. And Jesus says, you're impressed by that. He brings up a Bible story. Jacob Flatter. He said, don't be impressed that I saw you under a fig tree. Impressed with this, you're going to see the Son of Man ascending and descending. Angels descend. In other words, Nathaniel, if you follow me, you will have found what your heart is longing for. Brothers and sisters, when we find him, we find what our heart is longing for over and over again. I said yesterday, give me a few more minutes. I might go a little long, but I won't come back for another six months or something. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't a bar room in America that's discussing the virginity of Mary. Or the, or the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Or the liturgical calendar. Or, God forbid, three streams. But those people have a heart that's longing for something. There are single mothers around us with a heart that are longing for someone. There are drug addicts and alcoholics. One out of ten families has a drug addict in their family. Probably most of us sitting here know somebody. We talked about prison. I just spoke to a young man or prayed for the young man who, 18 years old, just got sentenced to 42 years in prison for driving a car drunk and killing somebody. His heart is longing. I have another friend that's getting out after 40 years, David coming out to a world he hasn't seen. He doesn't know cell phones, computers, and he's coming out alone. His heart is longing. See, Jesus is the one that meets the longing of our hearts. And our call is to bring people to Jesus. There's a revival going on in America right now. I was part of, and many of you sitting here, of the revival of the late 70s, the Jesus Revolution. I wasn't in the Jesus Revolution, but that hit the country. Charismatic renewal in many churches. I know some of you came out of that. And uh, that's what hit. What hit when I was in the Episcopal Church and I was in ministry, and all of a sudden, somebody said, you need to ask Jesus into your heart. And he came. I cried for three days. I could cry now if I told you the story. Because the longing had been fulfilled. I don't have a theology for that, by the way. 
You know, people now, they say, there's no theology about being born again. I say, well, okay. But I am. <laughs> That's all I know. I'm like that blind guy. Once I was blind and now as I see, you go talk to theology about it, I don't care. Because I know people whose lives have been changed, transformed, made new, are different, new direction. Some can't, I can't even remember the old me. Huh? And then I got baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's another theological question. Are you baptized in the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit? Or? I don't know. What I know is Shambhakaduni on my back. The Holy Spirit came upon me. And I prayed for thousands of people for the same thing. And it changed. And the biggest change of all is I couldn't stop talking about Jesus. I just couldn't stop talking about him. And I wanted to learn more and more and more about who, who is he? Who is this son of God? We're in the midst of revival, and I believe the CEC is going to be a significant part. I think this is a church made for revival. Because everything we do in worship is about Jesus. Everything. Songs were about Jesus this morning. I hate songs that are about me. You know, you ever get in there and they tell you, oh, it's all about me. My daughter, the same one, would want to grow up and be a uh, woman. She used to dance, she was a dancer. And um, ballet. Okay? And when she was little, she used to, we hated Christmas coming around because the Nutcracker would be on 24 7. <laughs> and she would dance around and. Uh, but once, one day she's just dancing around the living room, you know the song? It's all about you, Jesus. And she was going around, it's all about me, Jesus. <laughs> For my glory and my praise. <laughs> I hate those songs. <laughs> it's about him. And I found if I focus on him, I forget about me. And the things around me, that song grows strangely dim in the light of his glorious and grace. People come to church and they want their dimmer turned on. To see Jesus. Just this past, past two weeks ago, and I just learned about this church, I didn't know it existed, but I was impressed. 55,000 20-year-olds showed up to worship. And I watched the worship. It's worship. I don't know what their theology is. It's probably bad. Yeah. Tell you another story. I remember one time I got home. Oh, I was so arrogant. So arrogant. I got home from a service at night and I sat down and, and uh, you know, I'm Episcopalian, so I had a drink. And um, I think I made a sandwich. I turned on the TV and this was pre remote. So in order to change the channel, you had to get up, you know? And uh, my remotes had gone to bed, my children. Uh, and on the, the, the television was, was this preacher, Southern preacher, and, uh, who later got arrested for sexual stuff. But he could preach, man. Except everything he said was heresy. And I, I knew the truth, you know. Um, and I'm sitting there, and the more he's preaching, the more I'm getting angry. I mean, it's just stirred up inside of me. And I got up, and I stormed out of the room, banged my hand on the kitchen cabinet, and God spoke to me one of those audible words that I like him. <laughs> now, I didn't say I like his theology. I don't like him. And he does. And then you get back there and look at him the way I look at him. See him. I don't know the plan for, I, it's Jimmy Swagger, by the way, I don't know the plan for his life. I know he's preached on TV again. And now I have a remote so I can move on. <laughs> 
But see, it's coming to that. And here's why we're in revival. And I know many of you come from evangelical tradition. I don't. I come from a liturgical background. Became evangelical. Didn't give up liturgical. And I became Pentecostal, too. But I think the story that God has upon us as a church now is Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus. And if you read that, go study that real slow. In fact, I would suggest do this, memorize it so that you can tell it to somebody without looking at it. Because there's some real catches in there. One of them is, remember, they're walking along and what, they don't see him. Can't see. It's right there. They're disciples. They're part of the inner group. And he begins to explain to them everything in the prophets concerning him. He doesn't explain everything in the prophets. He explains everything in the prophets concerning him. And their hearts began to burn. And then he's going to leave. And he says, no, let's break bread. And what happened? Their eyes were open. And they saw him. And that even more, they knew him. Intimately knew him. Brothers and sisters, you're part of a revival that's centered right in that verse. Right there. That this morning, I'm going to break bread. Now, if you go after me, what does that mean? Your bishop has a good definition. I can never remember it, but it's a good one. You know? I don't know what happens there. You know? I really don't. There's a part of me that believes in transubstantiation because I know I'm of the same substance but a different... because I'm born again. You know? Something's happened that's not... that I can say it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life I live, I live by faith. I don't know what that means. If you do, good for you. Don't bore people with your explanation. <laughs> Talk about Jesus. So I don't know what happened. I know this, that he said it, and I believe it. And at a moment, we will lift that bread of everything that's going on in this area. Smoke machines, guitars, music, preaching, Whatever's happening, even football, the most important thing in this area is happening right here, this morning, in this moment, that Jesus is going to be known to us in the breaking of the bread. That we'll say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Amen? Is that a good word? Thank you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please stand and share the peace.
The Lord be with you. With your spirit. Please be seated as, and prepare your hearts as the table is prepared for us. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread. We offer you fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become the blood of Christ, our body of Christ. Blessed be God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become for us the blood of Christ. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we bring these tithes and offerings before you. They will be used in your church for the work you have set before us and the furthering of your kingdom. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your remains for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all his church. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. And lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you have revealed the mystery of our salvation in Christ as a light for the nations. And when he appeared in our mortal nature, you made us new by the glory of his immortal nature. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. Again, he gave you thanks and praise, gave the cup to his disciples and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith.
to celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that, that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Jesus died for you, and feed on him in your hearts, with thanksgiving.
pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with the gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. I oh, thank the um, the worship team, man. They're good. They, they, can, they can really get you in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and I'm hoping a lot of you come to uh, Orlando for the convocation, and uh, all of you. It'll be a great time in Orlando in July or something. Um, stories told that uh, Pope one day was sitting in his office working on some paper very studious and all of a sudden one of the priests comes running in and said holy father Jesus is walking down the center island tile of the Vatican what should we do and he says look busy <laughs> <laughs> called to him Jason you're a Joshua you know that You've gone halfway up the mountain and watched Moses and calls on you, but it's to him. Don't worry about what you're going to do. People ask that all the time. They'll go through ministry all the time, right, Bishop? You say, what do you do for a living? <laughs> well, I drink coffee a lot. I talk to people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> try to pray. <laughs> Don't worry about what you do. It's, it's who. People, the people want to know him. That's what they want. They want to know him in joy and sadness and mourning and grieving. They want to know him. They want to know how to pray. To cry out to him. They need, if I'm going to bless you, the gospel, the good news. Remember the gospel. If you're listening and it sounds like bad news, it's not the gospel. Because the gospel is good news, incredibly good news. That God was in Christ Jesus, reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us. He also isn't counting our righteousness. No. God loves you. There's nothing you can do to make God love you anymore. Nothing you can do to make God love you any less. He's decided to love you. He's forgiven you. You just need to receive it. Stop running around trying to forgive yourself. You can't. Because you didn't sin against yourself. <laughs> you sinned against God. And he's forgiven you. Receive it. And so God's not angry with you. Never was, never will be. And above all, above all, I've learned by his grace that he'll never leave you, nor will he forsake you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and with those you love and care for this day and forever. Amen. Amen.
Now let us go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.